Although not every piece of our service this morning has depicted transgender visibility, I do hope that you have witnessed the theme of commitment to selves through the songs from Ray Spoon and the story from Jazz Jennings, as well as Phyllis's reflection. And you can begin to see the commitment of a community through our hymns, Fire of Commitment, and answering the call of love and our opening words about community as well as our directed donation requests. I believe that these two layers of commitment weave together beautifully our possibility for a faith community seeking to support trans individuals and others who identify as part of the LGBTQ plus circle. This congregation made a commitment to LGB community after having run a program called Welcoming Congregations. But what could, return to, what could returning to that commitment look like? What could recommitting to being a welcoming congregation spur for us and for the faithful and spiritual Kelowna-ite around this city? Let me back up several years and try to tell this tale from the beginning. New York City Stonewall Riots happened in 1969. Toronto bathhouse raids happened in 1981. As the rights of men and women who identified as gay and lesbian and bisexual started to become more prominent in our worldviews, as justice issues became more prevalent, many organizations and jurisdictions began challenging police's policies and creating systemic shifts that committed to creating a safer world for all. Specifically, the Unitarian Universalist Association began the process of developing a curriculum to help their congregations learn how to undo homophobia. This program was launched in the early 1990s called the Welcoming Congregation Program. Congregations across the continent were supported to commit to undoing homophobia within their congregations and communities and within individuals' hearts and minds. By the time the program closed down in 2014, over 800 congregations had achieved completion status, including and that was my dogs just walking into the room. Sorry about the interruption. <laughs> Including every one of the 53 congregations in Canada. It seems almost as though the term welcoming congregation was no longer a clear identification, a title given only to those communities who had completed the program. But any congregation who, Unitarian Universalist or not, allowed lesbian, gay, and bisexual individuals to join were calling themselves welcoming. And perhaps that is a sign of the time that homophobia within our faith communities and our society at large is no longer an issue. But sometimes I wonder if it was more a problem with the way that the UUA titled their program and their identification. I will agree that our society has come a long way from the homophobia of the 70s and 80s. But now, one of the larger challenges is the heteronormativity of our society and of our faith community. Heteronormativity is the belief that heterosexuality and by virtue, the gender binary, is the default and that everything else is a deviant. Even in a society that is no longer afraid or enraged by homosexuality, they still see this as other. Over the 20 plus years of the welcoming congregation's life, it had several updated versions. One revision included becoming more inclusive of transgender identity. And at one point, this congregation went through the process to earn welcoming congregation status. Although when I looked at the church office and throughout our building, I could not find any specific details about when that happened. 
or what specific programming was done, how many people participated. Although many of our congregation do talk about it happening, it does seem a little bit hazy with most of the details. It is clear to me that many people were excited. Many people within Colonial Unitarians were excited about the commitment and wanted the program to happen. That there was an intensity and perhaps an urgency when making the commitment. But much like dozens, if not hundreds of other UU congregations across the continent, it seems like the long-term commitment was not present within this community. The long-term commitment to stamp out heteronormativity and the gender binary have not really been present. Now, before people start getting defensive, because I have to say that if I were in the pews today and not in the pulpit, I would be getting a little bit defensive right now. I do want to say that there are many, many people among our community who have committed to not only allyship, but also activism for the LGBTQ individuals and communities. There are people here who are committed to activism because of loved ones and because of a sense of moral duty. And yet, as Kelowna Unitarians as a whole, there has been very little action in this area. In our opening words, Casper Turkheil speaks of this idea of community that is becoming more prevalent in our society. One in which brief, occasional, and intense experiences is all that it takes to create community. This is something that I want to rail against and something that I have experienced way more often than I would like to admit. I do believe that community can be created during intense periods of time. And yet I believe that the depth of community that comes from those moments is somewhat shallower than the commitment resulting from communities that take time to develop trust, resilience, care, and healing. I have spent much time in brief and intense gatherings creating community. In fact, much of the national UU events do just this. They create community briefly over the span of a long weekend, occasionally, every other year, and intensely by cramming as much programming, networking, and worshiping together in as they can. Also, my divinity program at seminary was planned much the same way coming together for what was actually called intensive. We gathered for one week, 40 hours with the intention of learning and discerning ministry during those section sessions. Of course, they attempted to stretch out that learning both with pre-work and post-work, but the community was built during that class session. During, perhaps this was what happened with Colonial Unitarians, gathering together to commit to becoming a welcoming congregation. There was a clear goal, a clear commitment, get through this program, successfully achieve welcoming congregation status, and bask in the joy and, a complete, and accomplishment of that completion. But the commitments really work that way? Later in his reflection, Casper Turkheil states, communities in which we grow and flourish last over time and are built by people who are faithful to one another and committed to shared purpose. Community life certainly has its moments of incredible beauty and intensely personal connections, but much of it is daily and ordinary. Our lives are knit together, not so much by intense feelings as by shared history, tasks, commitments, stories, and sacrifices. I believe that Colonial Unitarian's commitment to being a welcoming congregation needs to be reviewed. I think we need to return to the daily and ordinary tasks of engaging in the practice of radical welcoming and learning how to undo the harm that homophobia 
and heteronormativity have ingrained into our society. In 2015, almost six years ago now, the UUA unveiled a renewal program for welcoming congregations. And recognizing that the work of inclusion is never over and the circle can always be cast wider. The renewal program highlights five pillars that require annual commitment. The first pillar is to submit an application articulating the work that has been done since the previous application. The second is to commit to incorporating welcoming worship services into every calendar year. Third is to offer recognition and celebration of LGBTQ days of observance. Fourth is to offer an annual religious education program centered around LGBTQ issues. And finally, the fifth is to support a project. Committing to these five actions, celebration, lamenting, learning, and supporting with the LGBTQ community will bring more inclusion, not only into our church, but also more inclusion into our lives. One of the journey group res resources for this month's theme on commitment was a video on YouTube called How to Be a Good Ally. And in the introduction, there was something that hit home for me. The host stated this, allyship isn't passive. If there was a war, your allies don't just sit there and be like, oh my gosh, genocide? That sucks, man. I can't even. People can be so awful. The times that we live in are just so hard. No. Allies send their troops. They lend their ships. They send supplies and medics. They will go in and they will fight for you. Allyship is not neutrality. Allyship is an active process that you are always working on. In other words, allyship requires commitment. And if Colonial Unitarians want to continue being a welcoming congregation, if we want to state explicitly that all, that we welcome people of all gender identities and sexual orientations, we need to commit to the active process of dismantling the systems of heteronormativity within ourselves and our community. As we witness this week of Transgender Day of Visibility, I urge you to examine your commitments to the faith, to this faith that is inclusive, a faith that believes that everyone is sacred and everyone is welcome, and perhaps determine how you can help this community recommit to welcoming everyone. Thank you so much for listening today.